Good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Hope you're having a good morning so far. Uh, I want for just a minute to direct some attention toward our mission train, mission train, our mission team that is in Liberia, Africa right now. I got to talk with Tony a little bit this morning. Tony, for those of you who don't know, Tony and I co-pastor here at Living Water, and so he is co-pastoring in another country, and I am here to get to hang out with you guys, and both of us are super excited today. And so I got to chat with him this morning. Um, he said he was praying for us to have a good day, and I said praying for you guys to have a good day, and he said we already are because it was like noon there when I talked to him at nine o'clock this morning. So they were already rolling. They're already at like afternoon nap time at this point in the day, right? And so he said they've had the opportunity to teach Sunday school this morning already. And so just some really cool things happening. So I would ask that you guys would continue to be in prayer for them, just asking that they would be blessed, that somehow it wouldn't feel quite as hot as it is, that uh, people would be reached uh, and that our team would be blessed. That always seems to be how that goes on a, a mission trip. You're like, we're going to help people. And those people wind up helping you more more than you help them. And so go Jesus. We're excited to get to be part of that. So they just kind of an update. We've got us half the team coming back this Thursday and the other half will come back uh, a few days later. And so excited to, uh, to hear from them and to get to, to see them in a few days. So with all of that said, we're going to move forward with our series today. Uh, we're still in the series called Flawed. Uh, and my favorite thing to do is ask you guys this question. How many of you are flawed? Right, and the rest of you are liars, so that makes you flawed. So we're all in the same place. All right. So just to, we are human and we make mistakes. This is the way this works in our in our humanity, right? And so we're going to continue this morning. And it always is a weird feeling uh, when preparing to teach about one of our heroes of the faith that we get out of Hebrews 11, and and we hone in, or I have to hone in on finding their flaw, right? Well, they're. So amazing what God has chosen to do with them. We're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, right? And so we're able to find their flaws, but it almost feels wrong to point those out. But here is the reason that we're doing this. The reason is so that you will hear and so that I will hear and we'll go, oh, they're human. They're just like me. God used them for such a great thing in spite of their flaw. And so that's the, the statement that we've carried through each one of these sermons is this, no matter what your past contains, God has a purpose for you. And for those of you who are like, I am so glad that I am a behind the scenes person and I don't have to do all that out there talking to people's stuff. I love you. Yes, you do. All right. <laughs> so we all have a purpose that is visible and God is calling us into something despite our fear, despite our struggle, no matter what that is. And so today we're going to lean into our next hero of the faith, and that is Rahab. Uh, Rahab is, uh, man, a woman who time after time after time in Joshua 2, uh, we get to see her step out and act on her faith. And so what I want for you to do is to as we listen, I'm going to read the entire chapter of Joshua 2. It's 22, 23 verses. And so I'll do a little commentary as we walk through that. But I want you to listen, not just for her flaw, but I want you to listen for where she was faithful, how she took those steps. And I want you to, to think through that. Some of you guys already know the story of Rahab, and you're like, well, I'm not struggling with the same thing that she is. I promise you, you are. There is one thing that all of us have in common with Rahab, and it's my hope that we'll get to kind of peel that onion back, and you'll get to see that today as we walk through. So we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. Uh, scripture will be up here on the screen. You've also got uh, access to it on your uh, smartphone. If you want to look up the mylivingwater.cc, you can scroll down to sermon notes. If you don't want to do that, you can scan the code on the back of the chair in front of you. So we got access. There's a really cool place where you can take notes, and you can write down stuff that I didn't say, just in case it's horrible. All right? So you can make your own notes. It'll be great. So we're going to continue, or we're going to start reading in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this. <clears throat> then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. So the Israelites, they were moving all the Israelites together. Uh, Joshua was now leading them and he sent these spies in because they were soon going to be crossing over the Jordan and Jericho was close to the Jordan. So it was a good idea to send these spies in to say, hey, what's happening? Uh, what, what's happening in this town? What, what, uh, what is their culture like? Who are they worshiping? Uh, so they could get an idea of what was happening. Uh, pretty quickly, if you do any study, uh, reading some commentaries and some history, pretty quickly you'll see that most people are going, wait, why did they go 
to a prostitute's house? Like, was there nowhere else in the whole town they could have stayed, right? Um, If you were to come to me and say, hey, I'm going on a trip. I'm probably going to stay at a prostitute's house. I'm going to say, probably not, okay? Let's, Let's find a comfort inn or some other option, right? But the culture here, this was actually probably a good choice for these spies to say. Um, There was nothing that insinuates they were there uh, to engage in what was happening in that house other than to stay and to remain anonymous, right? As you can imagine, a a house like that would be a place where no one shared names and, and no one knew who was coming and going. It was probably pretty secretive. So against our better judgment and what we would say, don't do this, it was probably a pretty good idea for the spies. And so again, nothing leads us to believe they were there to engage in what was happening in that house, but to go and remain hidden. Uh, Verse 2 says this, the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. And so the king was concerned. He had heard about these spies that had come in. King's not a fool. And so he understood that they were coming to see what was going on so they could case the place, if that makes sense, so they could know what was happening and, and how, what they would need to do, what the Israelites would need to do to take over and potentially destroy this place as they had destroyed others. And so the king sent uh, two of his men to go and ask Rahab what was going on. Verse 4, we pick up, it says, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. So Rahab lied to the men from Jericho, her people, right? She was in Jericho. She was in that culture. She was running apparently a pretty lucrative business in this town. And so when the men from Jericho came, instead of siding with them and going, you know what? I didn't know they were coming to hurt us. I didn't know they were coming to take over and to change us. They're up on my roof. Go get them, right? She didn't do that, but she lied, right? She lied and said, I don't know who these men are. I don't know what they're here for. And so the men, she then encouraged to go and, and chase them down and told them that they had left. And so as we move on, verse 8 says, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water on the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt, for, for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. And so Rahab asked them by the power of their God, whom now it appears she believes in, to save her and her family from what was coming to Jericho. She could only assume what was going to happen is what had happened to Sihon and Og and in their kingdoms that had been destroyed because they weren't worshiping God. They were opposing God. And so then she asked that she and her family be spared when the Israelites come to Jericho. And they replied, verse 14, our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go on your way. Verse 17, now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in your house, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. "Let Let it be as you say. So she went, she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Verse 22, when they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had reached all along the road, searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. 
all the people are melting in fear because of us. So, a lot of stuff happening here, right? You got spies, you got Rahab, you got the men coming from Jericho, you got Rahab bringing her family into this matter. She's sending these men out of a window uh, down by a rope so that they can escape. She, she not only was she a, a prostitute, which is obviously something that we know is, is sinful and it's uh, degrading to her own body, right? But then she lied as well. And so it seems like it should be really easy for us to go, there's the flaw. That's what it is. She, she made poor choices, right? She, she had a profession that wasn't honorable. It was against God. You're right. You're right. This wasn't okay. It was totally normal for her culture, right? It was what was happening around her. It's what she had seen. She lived in a, a, a town and a community in a city where people didn't worship God. They worshiped other things. Maybe they worshiped their own bodies or they worshiped their own gods that they could create, right? At, at best, it was a, a way for her to make money, and it still wasn't okay. And so you're right, that was a flaw in Rahab's life, but I don't think it's the flaw that we need to look at today. She also lied, right? How many of you know that lying is good, and you tell your kids, you lie every chance you get? None of us, right? No, that's actually one of the, the only rules, and I'm not going to look toward my kids right now, but that's one of the only rules that, that frustrated me. It was the rule that frustrated me the most, because if you're not honest with me, we, can't, we lose trust, right? Lying is a big deal. We shouldn't lie. And of course, we can get in this discussion about Rahab, man. What, what was she going to do? Was she going to lie to the people of Jericho so that the spies would be okay? Was she going to lie about this, or lie to the spies and pretend so that these, she could then get the men from Jericho to come and get them? She was in a tough spot, right? And we can all come up with a scenario where lying is actually better than telling the truth because it protects someone. And you guys ever been in a situation like that where to lie brings a greater good than to tell the truth and let something bad happen to people? This is a tough discussion, isn't it? This can be difficult. You can argue with me and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the truth no matter what, and I'm going to trust God. Okay, I hear you. I'm not saying that I disagree with you. I'm saying take me to lunch, buy my lunch, and we'll talk about it. All right, cool? <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab lied. But I want to submit to you this morning that those aren't the things that we have in common with her. That's not the thing that we have in common with her that was her greatest flaw. As we read in Hebrews eleven thirty one, 31, it says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. It doesn't say Rahab lied and she shouldn't have done that, but it worked out okay, so we're going to move on, right? Scripture doesn't speak and say what she did was wrong. It also doesn't speak and say what she did was right. But it moves on in the story, and so that has to make us say, okay, so there must be something else here. Like, lying is not okay. Like, let me get this in my head. We're probably not going to be in the same spot that Rahab was, so we're not having to figure out whether we should lie or tell the truth or what we should do. But maybe we should look further into the Scripture and see what was going on. And so um, while those are flaws, Rahab, raised in the pagan culture that, that she was in, uh, she did not know to follow God. She probably didn't even know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob existed at this point, right? She was leaning into what she had known and maybe how she had been raised and taught, right? She may have made some of these choices on her own, but nonetheless, what she was doing, her sin, was separating her from God. It was putting a, a, a chasm or a, a, a gap in between uh, her and, and the God of heaven and earth. And so what we see is Rahab was living her life apart from the God of heaven and earth. And that was her, her greatest flaw. And I would submit to you, it's mine and your greatest flaw. Or at least it was before some of us came to know Christ. I would love to assume that all of us have committed our lives to Jesus Christ. And, and there's not a gap. There's not a separation. But do you know, even now when we sin, there's, there's something that doesn't feel right. There's a, uh, maybe we don't feel like we're as close to God when we sin and when we're choosing that sin in our life. That's because we have this in common with Rahab. We have this separation in common. And so she was living in and worshiping the culture that she was surrounded by. Does that sound familiar? And let's just pretend that we see it all around us and it's not us, okay? Does that make you feel more comfortable? It does me, if I'm being honest, right? I don't want to stand in front of you and just admit all my struggles and how I'm like, oh, well, I like the way these people are doing this and I, and I want to go this way. I want to make this decision because it seems like they're really happy. So I'm just going to do what they're doing because it looked like it worked out okay. Instead of praying to God and saying, God, should I do this? Shouldn't do this? Man, it just gets all jumbled, right? When we have to spend all that time praying to God, asking him what I should do, but that's exactly what we should do. 
right? We are separated by our selfish desires from a holy God, just like Rahab was. But something happened to Rahab. Something happened. As we, as we read, she, we see where she began hearing what God was doing with the Israelites. She heard about all these things that were happening and began speaking. And God began speaking to her through those stories. And she began believing in the God of Israel. She began believing in the God of heaven and earth. Have you, have you been there? Have you been there where in the midst of your struggles, people were around you and they were telling you stories about the miracles that God was doing in their life or maybe the miracles that God was doing in their church? If you've been here for a while, you've heard the stories. If you haven't, I would encourage you to go see an ENT and get your ears cleaned out because it's happening. In this church, God is performing miracles in people's personal lives and miracles taking their past and pushing it aside and, and moving people toward what God wants to do with them. And we get to see it time after time after time. And my hope is that you, just like Rahab, have had that happen to you. And you began to believe. You began to believe. And so we have this in common with Rahab. In verses uh, 8 through 11, Rahab proclaimed her faith in God to the spies. This was her confession of her belief in God in his strength and power and control over the nation. So the fact that she lied to the men from Jericho, in that moment, she could have stayed and she could have honored Jericho and what Jericho was. But instead, she turned her back on Jericho and said, I know these men are from God. She turned her back on not just Jericho, but all of her past. And in that moment, she moved toward God and she took a step of faith and she protected the spies that were, that were God's men. Sure, she lied. <laughs> but in that moment, she gave us a beautiful picture of what repentance looks like. Because repentance is not, I'm sorry. Repentance is, I'm out. I'm done with this and I'm going this way. And so Rahab turned from Jericho and turned toward God and decided to take a step in faith. She told the, the spies, the Lord has given you this land already. The inhabitants are faint-hearted because of you. The Lord dried up the Red Sea for you. I know it was you who destroyed the Amorite kings. Courage has left the people of the city because of you. Your God, your God is the God of heaven and earth. Tell me God wasn't working in Rahab before the spies showed up. This don't happen in a moment. <laughs> She began hearing she was in a place where men were coming in and they were telling the stories of what was happening with the Israelites. They knew what was going on. They were talking about the Red Sea being parted and the miracles that happened and the plagues that happened in Egypt. And so Rahab was hearing these things and God was doing a work in her. Has something like that ever happened to you? Have you just been so overwhelmed by the things that are going on around you and God goes, hey, that's me. That's me. I'm bringing healing. I'm bringing restoration, and I'm offering it to you. I'm offering it to you. Rahab acted. Rahab stood up. She, she was ready when those spies showed up, and she did what she had to do to protect them and to further God's work in his kingdom. There's so many times in our, our failed attempts at trying to save ourselves, right? That selfishness that separates us from God. We, we have an opportunity when God shows himself to us through people, right? Through, through our thoughts, right? Through his Holy Spirit. Um, we, can, we can still try to take it and do it on our own and just create that separation again. Or we can take a deep breath and go, all right, God, I know it's you. I know it's the God of heaven and earth. We can make that choice like Rahab did and we can take a step of faith. Verse 12 and 13 says, not only uh, was Rahab being courageous by acting on her faith, she asked to be saved, to be rescued, to be spared by God when the Israelites came to destroy Jericho. So she wanted to abandon her old life. Not only did she want to, she took a step. She wanted to live with God and the people of God. She betrayed her old ways, stepped out in faith and to, to embrace her new way of life because Rahab knew that God was the only one that could change her and give her a new life. Rahab knew, knew that God was it. Not God and, not God with, not God and this, this date and time. Do you know that? Do you know that God is the only one? Even in, maybe you think you have a really simple issue and it's easily solved. It's just something that's been around for a long time and it's hard to kick. If I could just get in one of those 12-step programs. Okay, as long as God's in it. 12-step programs are good when God's running it. A counselor, a therapist, a good friend, a good spouse, they are all good 
as long as God is the one that is making decisions through them. It is God and God alone through what he's put in your life that can heal the worst thing you can tell me. And I will, it will crush me to hear what your past is. Some of you have never shared it and some of you need the freedom to hear that you can. You get to share what your past is because immediately when you do, I'm gonna introduce you to a God that allows you to turn away from it and move toward him. And that's not just warm and fuzzy and let's all be excited, it's real. It happens if you trust the God of heaven and earth and you step out in faith, you'll find healing. Not because of God and, but because of God alone. Verse 15 through 21 says she let the spies down uh, uh, with a rope from her window. Uh, And as she did that, or after she did that, the spies gave her directions to follow so that the Israelites would not destroy her home and her family inside. And so if you guys haven't caught on yet, uh, God had the Israelites moving uh, all through different places, taking over, destroying cities and towns of people that were against him. And man, that sounds harsh. It's a hard pill to swallow, right? Uh, Do you know that God's wrath is still just as strong as it ever was? And we would deserve and feel more of his wrath if it wasn't for Jesus Christ dying for our sins and us having the grace and mercy and forgiveness offered to us through him. It's a hard pill to swallow because I want to go, God, why can't you just help the people of Jericho? Why couldn't you just make them better? Why couldn't you do for them what you did for Rahab? And what I read is he did. They could have done the same thing Rahab did. They could have found that faith. They could have believed that the God of Israel uh, was the God of heaven and earth and they would have been saved too. But what I don't want, to, want us to miss is that there was protection for her family in her house. The spies told her that um, if she would, and we'll hear in just a minute, if she'll hang that red cord from uh, her window and bring her family into her house, there was protection in the house, right? It wasn't that the, the house was a fortress. It was that God was going to protect the inhabitants of that house. And so I'm, I might get a little preachy here for just a second. So if you feel like I need to apologize to you, pretend that I just did, all right? And so the house offers protection. And so I I want us to know, biblically, the temple, like Jesus, lives in us. So we are his temple. But I would love for you today to picture with me that this building you're in is the house. All right? And so what happened is is Rahab's family came and showed up at that house because Rahab said there's protection here. And so what they might as well have said is, God, I have faith in you. I showed up because I believe I'm here because you are the one true God. So when her family showed up, that was their proclamation of faith. They didn't, Rahab wasn't a soldier. She wasn't protecting them. It was coming inside of the house that God had blessed and protected. And they got to proclaim their faith in God. And I'm submitting to you today, when you show up here, that's the same thing you're saying. I believe in God. I have faith in God. I'm stepping out. I'm acting on what I believe, that Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. So I'm going to show up with this family of believers to proclaim my faith. One amen? amen. Or seven. We'll take it. What if, what if when you get up on a Sunday, what if when I get up on a Sunday or a Wednesday or maybe we're having a Bible study on some other day and you show up, what if that is a proclamation of your faith in Jesus Christ? What if it's actually not a what if and it is a proclamation of your faith in Jesus Christ? Then that begs the question, when you don't show up, what are you proclaiming your faith in? Hear me. Where I make some people mad. Vacation is good. Time with your family is good. Taking a, a longer nap or sleeping in on a Sunday once in a while, it's okay. But I'm willing to bet our struggles are deeper than that. And we have a harder time getting up and coming to the house because we're putting our faith in something else. Because if your faith was in the God of heaven and earth like Rahab's faith is in this moment, you wouldn't be able to stay away from an opportunity to gather in the house. Amen? I did better. I didn't go as far on that. If you have faith in the God of heaven and earth, you will gather with your church family. And before I move on, I need you to hear, I need you. I need you. I'm preaching at you, to you, for you, all the things. I need you to show up because I struggle. I need to show up in here on Sunday or on a Wednesday or at a meeting, and I need to see your smiling face, and I need a hug. I need a high five. So it ain't just about you proclaiming your faith so you can be strengthened. I need you. 
And some of y'all need me too, and I'm right here. So let's come to the house for each other. All right, I feel like there's a t-shirt coming up. Bobby, are you working on that? Something about a house, we'll work on it. It's gonna be good, all right? So the scarlet, the scarlet cord, the spies instructed Rahab to hang a scarlet cord in her window so that the Israelites could identify her home and pass by it instead of destroying it. So this was, this was the marker. And you guys are, I'm, Garrett and I tied about 250 of these the other day and you're gonna get to grab one on your way out as a reminder for you. Um, the cord, I'm assuming, was a little bigger than this if she loads, lowered spies down with it, all right? But the spies said, hang this cord in your window so that when the soldiers from Israel come, they will know not to mess with this house. This is going to be the marker, this scarlet red cord. And so what Rahab did is she went back and she analyzed what they asked her to do and she thought through it for a while and prayed about it. No, she immediately hung this cord in her window. Why? Because of her faith. She already knew that God was the one protecting. She knew if she was obedient and did this thing that the spies asked her to do, that she and her family would be protected. So she took a step of faith immediately, to, an action. She didn't just sit. Scripture tells us that faith without works is dead. It doesn't tell us that works get us into heaven, but works are the proof of our salvation. And so uh, Rahab didn't know that because that's in the New Testament. Right, But she acted on her faith. She proved her faith by being obedient. And she took a step when she had the opportunity to take a step. And so my question to us today is, is what is your step? What has God already told you to do? What is the cord that you need to hang in your window? What is it that you've already been wrestling with for years of your life and you said, well, it, it's not time. It's I'm not ready. I can't do that. Um, somebody else will do that. That's uncomfortable. What is it? What is it? You're, you're holding this cord in your hand to, to say that you have faith, and yet you won't walk over to the window and hang it up. Why? What is it that's holding you back? I'll tell you what holds me back is trusting in myself. It's trust, waiting until I get strong enough, waiting until I get courageous enough, waiting until the timing is right and it feels better, waiting until it's easier. Because surely God doesn't want me to do anything difficult. Yes, he does. He actually is the opposite of who we are. He calls us to do things that are completely outside of who we are. That's actually probably a better way to decide if God is speaking to you. If what he said to you is difficult, it's probably him. All right? What is the step that you need to take? Rahab took the step immediately. This scarlet cord is not just a, a, an opportunity for, for her to act in obedience, but the fact that it's red um, and it was a symbol for uh, her and her family to be protected. It takes us back to uh, the Passover, right? When, when, the, um, when the plagues came and when the firstborn children in Egypt were all going to die, God said, paint over your doorpost with the blood of a lamb, like, and that would be the protection, and that would save your firstborn child from having to die, right? It's also a picture of the blood that was shed uh, by Jesus for us. It's because of that blood that is, I'm assuming, red like every one of ours is, right? It was protection for us, right? What a cool picture it is to know that, that this cord was so much more than just a thing to lower these spies down out of a window and just more than just a thing that protected Rahab and her family for a moment, but it's a picture for us that protection has already been given. We just have to step into it. We just have to step into it. To Rahab, this was a symbol for, of her salvation and deliverance from her old life. It was her way of saying, I believe in God and I've put my faith in him. He is the God of heaven and earth. Rahab was a, a prostitute destined for a life without God. She and her family were protected from the destruction that came upon Jericho. And so we see all these things that are happening through Rahab in this story. And it has to be just a little bit overwhelming to think that she went from who she was to who she now is in, the, in a matter of moments. But God didn't stop with her there. <laughs> this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab is in the line of Jesus Christ because of her faith. 
Can you imagine? And we, right now, Satan, I guarantee you, is in your head going, listen, this is an amazing story, but you're not Rahab. You're not. You're not, and look what God did with her anyway. Look at the culture you were raised in and you got to see God and know God and begin to understand God. And a lot of us went to this thing called Sunday school and some of us have been part of small groups and we've gotten to learn and we've gotten to learn under teaching and we've gotten to learn theology through some of our worship songs that we sing. And you've had the opportunity to make a whole other choice long before Rahab did and God still used her. So what does he have for you? Don't let Satan get in your head and tell you your situation's worse. Your situation's hard, I guarantee it. I guarantee you it's difficult, but it's not too hard for God. God sent his son to die for me and for you so that we could have protection from ourselves, from our sin. We have forgiveness and grace and mercy that is given to us because of what God did, because he loved us so much, he sent his son to die for us, to bleed for us, to atone for our sins. And then Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He arose from the grave and then gave us the greatest gift ever in the Holy Spirit. And you're looking at me going, I don't know if he can fix me. Kind of sounds dumb, doesn't it? Telling you it's not as difficult as we start twisting it and making it in our minds. Jesus Christ is in front of us saying, hey, I'm right here. Take your step of faith. Our biggest fear, our biggest lie, our biggest discomfort or struggle, our biggest financial problem, our biggest mistake, our greatest relationship issue, our our biggest habit, addiction, or past decision, and our biggest flaw is overcome by our greatest act of faith. Trust in God. There's nothing you can tell me that I would have to go, oh my gosh, that is a big deal. I'm not sure God can handle that. Nothing. Nothing. As much as Satan wants you to believe it. Because if you believe that God is not bigger than your greatest flaw, you won't move toward him. You won't close that gap. You won't act in faith. You won't trust God. Because what happens if you trust God? Satan gets reminded that he's already lost. Satan has to contend with another person who loves God and who is willing to take a step of faith and hang that red cord in their window and say, God is the God of heaven and earth and there's nothing that's going to stop me from turning my back on my past and moving forward into who you want me to be. Nothing. Did I say nothing? Somebody needs to hear that today. I know that I, I struggle with that. I, I, 90%, I was all in on God and wanted what God wanted for my life. I thought it was like 110%, but I realized that that selfishness still boils in me and there was something there that I needed to do something with. There was an act of faith that I needed to take a step in. And the moment that I did, God goes, I've been here the whole time. I've always been the God of heaven and the God of earth. And now that you believe it, take these steps. Take this step. And I don't know where you guys are at today. Some of you have a relationship with Jesus already and you're, you're taking steps, but there's another step he wants you to take. And some of you may look at me and go, I know what it is and I'm in the middle of taking it. I am actively taking this next step of faith. And some of you are going, I know exactly what it is and I have no intention of taking that step because it scares me to death. Guess what you have to do? You gotta take the step. You gotta trust in the God of heaven and earth because he's so much bigger than all the reasons you can come up with to not take the step. And then some of you, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is the first time you've heard that there is a God like this that can overcome your past, that can overcome your decisions, that can overcome the things that have happened to you and that you have an option of a new life. And you need to make that commitment today and that's your step. That's your step. Don't leave today without making it. There's, there's freedom. And hear me, I didn't say it's easy. Anybody, anybody a Christian for a while and have followed God and taken steps that he's asked you to step and you're like, this is gravy. Anybody? No, because it's not, because it's not who we are to desire the things of God, to want to take a step of faith like he is asking us to take. But what he does, he's the only God that offers this. He's the only God anyway, but the other gods that you hear about will say, do this, be good, make changes. And then we don't know where they are. Our God, the God of heaven and earth says, come to me, you who are weary. Come to me and I will give you rest. 
trust in me, have faith in me. And then guess what he does? He puts his arm around us and he goes with us. He never kicks you out and pushes you out to do it on your own because you can't, because I can't. We have to trust him fully in order to take that step of faith. So this morning, what I want to leave you with, um, back in the back, Heath is going to get out a table and I've got a bunch of these tied together. And what I want for you is to decide how this is going to help you take your next step of faith. Some of y'all don't know what your next step of faith is. Let's have a conversation. You can go to the next steps desk. You can come up here to me. We can figure out a next step. We can figure out what that step is for you. You can come to me and cry on my shoulder and be scared to death because you know what your next step is. We'll work through that too. Get one of these as you leave today. I don't care if you untie it so you can tie it on something else that you see all the time. I don't care if you put it on your keychain. I don't care if you walk around with it in your hand and try to continue in life with just one hand because this means so much to you. Fantastic. Take your step. This scarlet cord can be a reminder of the time that, that Rahab stepped out in faith. She acted in faith immediately when she knew what she was supposed to do. And I want to encourage you to do the same this morning because our greatest flaw is overcome by our greatest act of faith, and that's trusting God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for, God, the accounts we have in Scripture of, of heroes of the faith, God. It's unbelievable to see and to read and, and try to imagine what you did with Rahab and, and how you helped her to turn completely away from her past, God, and step into a new life that you had for her. And then, God, you, you blessed her and allowed her to be part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. God, you want to do a work in us just the same that you wanted to do a work in Rahab. God, when we believe, we have faith in you. We will have opportunities to take a step, to, to act on our faith. And God, that's my prayer, that as everyone leaves here today, or maybe as they gather in conversations, they take a step, they act on the faith that they have in you, Father. So God, challenge us, give us courage, give us strength. God, help us to, to recover from the difficulties in life so that we can act on our faith and so that others will see and they will come to know you because of it. God, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.